and turn with me to 1 Corinthians and 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15, if you want to make a Baptist preacher preach short, make sure that the pulpit was within smelling distance of the kitchen, and that, that'll uh, shorten it by at least a point and a half and one poem, amen? Those just won't seem important uh, as they get preaching and get more and more hungry. First Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse number 12. I want to read actually a, a, a few verses, quite a few verses of Scripture, but they're all meaningful and important for us this morning. So if you'll follow along, I'll begin reading in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse number 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain. And your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. And then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ, Christ's at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Father, I pray that you would help us to try our best to let some of this truth sink in. It's, it's higher than we can reach. Is deeper than we can dive. It is more than we can fully understand. But I pray that we will let some more of this seep into our consciousness that we might be more and more sure and, and reassured and firm in our faith in the risen Savior. And Father, help us to understand the importance of it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. As they ate... That first resurrection day, you find that Jesus sits down with his disciples. They're still in somewhat of a shock uh, that Jesus has risen. Uh, and uh, as they ate together, uh, as a matter of fact, let's look over at Luke chapter 24. Let's, let's go there first here uh, before I, I'm just starting to get ahead of myself a little bit. Luke chapter 24, I told you I can smell the food and I start getting ahead of myself a little bit. Luke chapter 24, and look in verse 44 uh, down through verse 48. The Bible says in verse 44, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake with unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. If you don't understand it, let me point it out. If you didn't catch it, let me point it out. When he says the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, that's the Old Testament. And so, and which is the Bible that they had. The New Testament had not been written yet. They had the Old Testament, which was 
the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. And, uh, and so he said, they testify of Jesus Christ. There is an old and a new testament, an old covenant and a new covenant. The old covenant that God made with the nation of Israel, the new covenant wherein we stand, which is mentioned in the Old Testament when he, God said, the Lord said, I'll make a new covenant with you, not like the old covenant from the mountain. This covenant is going to be a covenant of faith. And he talks about that in the Old Testament. We think it's something that just kind of happened. But there is one Savior, Jesus Christ. And so the Bible says here, he opened their understanding in verse number 45. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. I want you to see before we get off, of, off track here again, notice that the gospel has always been intended to reach to all nations. It's it, to the Jew first, then also to the Gentile. And so we have here that he mentions, he says this was always the plan that Christ would suffer, that he would die and rise again the third day. And then once that happened, repentance and remission of sins should be preached, notice, among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. As Jesus sat down to eat with the disciples that first resurrection day, he, uh, he said, pass the broiled fish. I'm not making that up. It's in the Bible. Pass the broiled fish. Pretty sure it was walleye. Just my study of the Greek, right? Uh, but anyway, uh, no, it was not. Uh, but... But he said, pass the broiled fish, and he ate with them, and they were astonished. And he began to teach them and, and, and talk to them and help their understanding the things that he had been telling them that they did not comprehend. Now he, the risen Christ, is sitting in front of them as their instructor and said, remember what I said to you. Remember what I taught you. And their understanding begins to uh, come alive. They begin to, to comprehend what before was incomprehensible because they had, they had nothing to go by. They had, they had, they had no history. They had no, no, no awareness of it and couldn't imagine, as we often cannot, could not imagine how God would fulfill his plan other than the way we figure it out. But God has ways that are not our ways. And so... When you put these together as Jesus sat, they had been called, the disciples had been called to be witnesses of these things. And witnesses does not, we, we think of witnesses as someone who just observes something that happened. But a witness in the Bible is someone who testifies to what they've seen. And so when he says, ye shall be witnesses unto me, he doesn't say you're going to sit around and watch. He's saying you're going to go testify of me. And so you are witnesses of these things. You are testifiers to these things. What a great spiritual victory has been won by the Lord Jesus Christ. When he came out of the grave, he won the victory. And they were supposed to go then and tell the story to the world. We are still to be doing that. When Jesus rose from the dead, old enemies that had plagued man since sin entered into the world were then defeated that day. I want to talk about some of the enemies that were defeated when Jesus Christ rose from the dead. First of all, death. The enemy of death was defeated. 
as we read in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, uh, just a moment ago, that Jesus came out of the grave and he rose from the dead, overcoming death. And so what does the Bible say? O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Imagine the struggle that ensued that morning as death tried to hold on to the prince of life. He who is life, uh, breaking free from from uh, he who is death. And it was, listen, it was no contest, amen. It, no more would death be able to claim victory and sting the human race with the bitter curse of sin because Jesus entered the domain of death and rendered it helpless. He went into the throes of death and came out a victor. For the child of God now, death is merely a passageway from, from here to be with the Lord. Death uh, does not hold the fear that it used to have. I'm not saying death is pleasant. I'm not saying there aren't things about the dying process that, uh, that concern us. But if we're saved and we know Jesus Christ as our Savior, we are no longer fearful of being dead. When I was, uh, I've told this story before, but when I was uh, getting uh, geared up for knee replacement surgery and I went and they took x-rays of my knees and it's always, I don't know, it's always funny. They, so it's like, okay, you know, turn this way, turn that way. So then they were going to take, they took x-rays, uh, x-rays of my knees from the side. Then they said, okay, now turn, we'll take uh, x-ray of your knees from the front. And so I turned straight and they said, no, no, put your feet together so we can get them both at the same time. I said, my feet are together. <laughs> and they said, we've never had somebody that we couldn't get both knees on the same screen. <laughs> but uh, I was, you know, pretty bow-legged, right? <laughs> my knees were so bad. And every time they would, I mean, you know how they're just, if you, you know, if you had x-rays taken, you're, you're here, and they just step behind this screen, but they're in the same room. Okay, so they're, they're, the technician is there, and you can hear, <laughs> And then you hear the technician go, oh, my word. I'm like, you know, I can hear you. It's like, oops. <laughs> and so, okay, well, here, we'll take this one. Good grief. Still hearing you? <laughs> I remember the, the surgeon came in, and he's looked at the x-rays, and he said, how do you walk? I said, it only hurts when I breathe. And he said, what do you mean? I said, when I stop breathing, it will stop hurting. He's, I mean, he is, he's not getting it. He said, are you suicidal? I said, no, it's worse. I said, I'm a Christian. <laughs> and I said, when I stop breathing, I'm going to be with God. And it ain't going to hurt anymore. And that doesn't scare me at all. He goes, oh, one of those. <laughs> yeah, I'm one, I'm, I'm one of those. <laughs> the people of the way. <laughs> you know, when you say it like that, it's like, you know, the people of the fern, people of the wood. <laughs> you know, and so we are, we are one of those, amen? Death, if we have our faith in Jesus Christ, death does not hold fear for us anymore. And I'm not talking about the process of dying. I'm talking about being dead. Hey, when I stop breathing, it'll stop hurting because we'll be with the Lord. Death, the, the biggest enemy that man faces today, um, that lost man faces for, for sure, the biggest enemy that we face, Jesus has conquered it and defeated it when he rose from the dead Heaven, just talking to somebody just this week about our family members that are with the Lord now. And I just was sharing with them, just imagining the things that my dad preached about 
for 65 plus years. And I just, as I was talking to my mom this week on the phone, and, and I was saying, you know, all those things he preached about for over 65 years, and now he's seeing them. But I think he's now looking and saying, I didn't do it justice. I didn't imagine far enough. I didn't go high enough because it's better than I ever thought it was. Oh, listen, when we have our faith in Jesus Christ, we do not have to fear what lies beyond the door of death because it is simply a door into heavenly splendor with Christ where, never, where, where every tear is wiped away, where the saints of God are in the presence of our Savior continually. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse number 8. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse number 8. The Bible says we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be, say it with me, present with the Lord. Oh, how important it is for us to understand that. It also is back in our text in, verse, in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians and verse number 26. And the Bible says, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Same chapter, verses 54 through 57. I mentioned it just a minute ago, part of it. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, O death, or death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Death is defeated. Secondly, let me say that Hell is defeated. When G Jesus entered death for mankind, the Bible talks about the fact that he descended into the heart of the earth. And the Bible says there he preached to those that were captive. And when he came out, the Bible describes it and it, it quotes part of uh, the Psalms saying he led captivity captive. In other words, he took that which was captive and released it or took it into his possession. And so those that were waiting for the resurrection, he led them, Luke 16. We're not going to probably read all these, but look at Luke 16. Luke chapter 16, beginning in verse number 19. It's hard to find a place to stop, but we'll just see how it goes here. Notice in, in verse number 19, there was a certain uh, rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus which laid at his gate full of sores, desiring to be fed with the crumbs that, which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died. It was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things. Likewise, Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to, you, to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him unto to my father's house. For I have five brethren that, they may, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, 
They have Moses and the prophets. And again, what is that? Old Testament. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he say, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they will not hear, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded though one rose from the dead. We, we know that. Matter of fact, um, a couple of weeks ago we were in discussion after I had preached on the wheat and the tares and I was talking to some of the men and they said, so we can't really know who's in heaven because you, you sometimes can't tell the wheat from the tares. I said, well, there's, there's no way for us to know positively, et cetera, and we don't know who's in hell. And the one man that brought the question up he said, I'm just thinking about my dad. Don't know 100% sure he's in hell. Because who knows what happened on his deathbed? Who knows what happened in moments before he went out of this world into the next? Who knows? We, we don't know. But I said this, I know one... So he said, so we don't know who's in hell. I said, I know one man for sure. One man for sure. It's not Hitler. And it's not any, you know, it's not any mass murders that you'd think of. It's the man in Luke 16. We know he's in hell. Because the Bible declares it so. It's no small thing that there is literally a hell. That people without Christ die and spend eternity in a place of torment. But I also want you to know that when Jesus came down, he proclaimed liberty. When he went down, he proclaimed liberty while his body was resting in the tomb, waiting for the resurrection. He himself, his spirit was in the, in the heart of the earth proclaiming liberty to every person who had died looking forward to his coming. And you find that in 1 Peter chapter 3. We don't take time to turn there. Then when he arose from the dead, he ascended to his father. And the Bible tells us that he took those souls with him in heaven. Now all those who believe in Jesus go directly there because Christ is there. Before Christ died, there was no death, burial, and resurrection yet. So they waited. But now, there's no more waiting. Willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Ephesians 4, 8 through 10. Let me hurriedly say, not only was death defeated, not only was hell defeated, but also the grave. All his life, man lives in fear of the moment when he'll lay down his body in death, that hole in the ground is nothing more than a place uh, to wait for the resurrection of this old sin-cursed body. But when it comes out of the grave, it'll come out changed. It'll come out a glorified body in newness of life, literally, forever changed to be just like the Lord Jesus Christ. Instead of weeping, uh, saints have reason to shout. Now, do we, are we sad? We're sad. But we're not sad for them. We're not sad for them. We're sad for us. And then, let me say, sin was also defeated that day. Sin had been taken care of really three days earlier when Jesus Christ died on the cross because at his death, he is the spotless, sinless Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world, as declared by John the Baptist. And so as John the Baptist declared, Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world. And when he died, the payment was made. But not only is he our perfect sin sacrifice, he's also our perfect high priest. And when he went, to, he ascended to the Father, the Bible says, not without blood, he entered into the holy place not made with hands. And he presented his blood for us and defeated sin. 
One, you see, uh, a dead Savior can't save anybody. One who's alive can save all who will come to him by faith. Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. And look at verse number 25. The Bible says in Hebrews 7, 25, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. And he goes on and talks about he is our high priest who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens. He did not need to offer sacrifices daily because he is the eternal sacrifice. And so he is able to save all who come to him in faith. This is a big verse and a big promise. It promises great things to everyone who comes to him in faith. Sin does not have to defeat you. If you turn to Christ, he forgives your sin. There's, I forget how it's worded right now, but Wilcox on the front sign of, out on the front of the church facing the highway. The penalty of the price of your sin is death. The next line says, Who is paying yours? Or who, who is paying for yours? Third line says, Jesus offers. And how true that is. You can pay for your own sin by spending eternity in hell. But why would you? If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, accept what he did for you on the cross of Calvary as the firm, full, and complete payment for your sin. And then, let me say, lastly, Satan was defeated at the resurrection. Um, calling Satan, calling the devil, calling the dragon, calling the accuser of the brethren, the old serpent, whatever name you want to call him, the outcome is the same. He's the enemy of God. He's the enemy of the people of God. He accuses the brethren of things. He goes before God daily trying to uh, create havoc for us. He tried every way he could to short-circuit Christ's plan to go to the cross, including the death, the death of the babies in Bethlehem the storm on the Sea of Galilee, the temptation in the wilderness trying to get Jesus to stumble, the oppression in Gethsemane, all of these things. However, Jesus endured every one of them. He weathered every storm. He endured every temptation on his way to the cross to die for you and for me. When Jesus said, it is finished, he did not simply mean life is over, my race is run. He meant the plan of salvation, the payment for it is now complete. He saw his power uh, overcome what, what uh, Satan had thrown at him. Satan witnessed the destruction of his own plan and he is doomed eternally. Uh, let's wrap this up by looking at Revelation. Enemies defeated at the resurrection, at the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Revelation chapter number 20. the defeat of Satan. Let me show you what's ahead for him. Amen? Revelation chapter 20, beginning in verse number one. I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottom, uh, bottomless pit, 
and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Jump ahead to verse 7. When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. End of story. He is a defeated enemy. He just has not yet had his final sentence instituted, but he is already defeated. Listen, people say, well, it doesn't matter about the resurrection. Oh, it matters. It definitely matters because in the resurrection, we have the defeat of things that trouble man and afflict man, the defeat of death itself and hell, the defeat of the grave and sin, and then the enemy of the soul, Satan. We have victory through Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you would help us, each one, to know for sure that we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We pray that if there's someone here that does not know Christ as Savior, that they will get saved today, realizing that there is no other way, there is no other help, there is no other hope, but in, in Christ is absolute hope. Father, I pray that if there's somebody here that is not saved, that come, let us take the Word of God and show them from the Scriptures how to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Lord, we are not fatalist. We are not, we are not suicidal. We, we are Christians. We are children of God waiting for the redemption of the, the purchased possession. And Lord, we look forward to that time. God, I pray that we would do what Jesus said to those first disciples as he met with them that first uh, resurrection day. Ye are witnesses of these things. Lord, help us then to be witnesses for a lost and dying world. As we have our heads bowed and our eyes closed, we stand to our feet.